So before we start, we're going to get into the objective facts, the stuff we absolutely know for certain. So first off, uh, Dragon's Dogma 2 will be a video game. And uh, these are the platforms it's releasing on. Steam, look at that. I don't see Epic anywhere. That's pretty cool. Next thing, scroll all the way down. Single player game. There is no co-op. You can probably still rent other players' pawns, but single player game. And frankly, I'm happy with that because it means that they're going to be investing more time into making sure that the pawns perform optimally. Their AI is the best it can possibly be instead of trying to create like a functional co-op system and uh, it's going to be made on re engine no release timing as of yet now before we get into like the actual trailer breakdown and yada yada i do want to say that i haven't watched any other trailer analysis videos so i am worried that i may end up just like repeating what other people are saying however it also does mean that my thoughts haven't been like skewed or influenced by uh, someone else's. So I hope I can provide a unique perspective. That's basically all I'm trying to contribute. I'm just trying to contribute something new to the conversation. Um, so just like, this is all speculative fun. We're just discussing a thing we like. From here on, it's, it's all just gonna be speculation, observation. Actually, while we're looking at this image, let's just like break it down. So all this arm is brand new. This might be the tattered mantle that he has equipped, but even then that's a stretch. Like the tattered mantle is just like a, a red, block of fabric it, it like it, it doesn't matter um obviously he's got like you know a heart motif 100 percent the arisen obvious most obvious shit there's a throne behind him in reference to how um the arisen ascends the throne or something um that was written somewhere tis a tale of one who shall slay the dragon and claim the throne that's why the arisen's got a throne behind him and fire probably because the dragon you know so um we'll get more into this character later because she appears in the trailer same with her but I just want to, like, mention, while it's here, her armor equipment, like, her armor looks to be completely new. But her weapon is the fluted bow, which is a short bow. You've also got, like, the ox down here and pulling, like, a wagon. And then, like, the arisen's just got, like, what I'm assuming are the pawns down here. I'm assuming these are all, like, pawns. This looks like a desert sort of region, like, with the little rocky mountains and uh maybe this is like a mining society with all these like contraptions i don't know i'm just talking out of my ass um anyway we're gonna get into the trailer now so it opens up with this uh i believe it's french quote conviction is the human will that reaches its greatest power now thankfully i've got several pages worth of notes that i wrote in regards to the trailer at 5 a.m so um this should help me stabilize my thoughts a bit make them a bit more coherent this quote very much so aligns with the motif of the original Dragon's Dogma. And it's good to see that right off the gate, they're returning to their roots. Human will, the will to live, all of that's been like like choosing your own destiny. That that's that's the major theme in Dragon's Dogma, aside from it being like an eternal cycle. I think it's very likely that the Seneschal and the Eternal Ring will still be a theme in this game. Like, just the fact that there's, like, this whole emphasis on human will and the Seneschal, like, is meant to embody that. The Seneschal is meant to seek out the one with, like, the will to lead the world to take their place because being Seneschal is pretty boring, so they want to find someone else who can replace them. So then they, like, make the dragon and the dragon is meant to seek out the Arisen, the person with, like, the greatest will and uh, refine them, test them, make sure that they're ready and capable of leading the world. And then the Seneschal performs the final test. Instead of rambling about this quote, we then go further along and um, we get ourselves a griffin. And uh, if we zoom in, there's two people on the griffin. Is it an arisen and their pawn? I don't know. Maybe they're two like major story NPCs. I was thinking, oh, maybe there's some sort of beast taming faction that's going to be introduced, but you'd think that they'd have riding equipment if that was the case. Maybe this actually represents like a fast travel component. Maybe they'll have like aerial mounts, flying mounts. Maybe they've been kidnapped by the griffin, but I was thinking like if they'd be kidnapped, it would hold them in its claws and we got ourselves a wagon and there's an ox in front. So we got the oxes back, oxes driving wagons. We've got it back. So I am very happy that we've got the ox back. I fucking love the ox quest. It, it's so much fun. Then if we continue further along, uh, let's, let's go back frame by frame. You can see these wings in the distance and 
that seems to be a harpy. And then it zooms out and uh, just like, it looks like escort quests are going to be, like the sort of wagon quests are going to be expanded upon. Instead of oxes just pulling hydra heads, maybe we're going to be pulling people to pulling bitches more like. Actually, I wonder what the beloved system is going to be like. L let's not get too sidetracked. Okay, so not too much to talk about there, but we're going to zoom out and we're going to get this. All right, let's see what we got here. Right in the center, I'm assuming this is Grand Sorin. We have a very long bridge. The Grand Sorin does have a bridge of similar make in the original game. However, it's nowhere near this long. And then they've got all like the ancient ruins outside in the front. It's still like, it's differently structured, but this looks completely different. I think I'm just going to get this out of the way. That way my like next points make more sense in the future. But I think this game is going to be completely disconnected from the first one in terms of, like, canon. I think it's going to be, like, like I think the lore is going to more or less be the same. But this should be viewed as, like, a completely separate timeline. This is, like, let's say the first game focused on the cycle of Arisen A. This is going to focus on the cycle of Arisen B. That's my guess. But it seems to be that this is, this is just Grancis. Like, there's Blue Moon Tower over here. This appears to be Grand Sorin, even if it looks different. So we're definitely in, in Grancis. And there's like some desert region over here, which is probably what the beast people inhabit based off this. This seems to be the desert region right here. Right, so I think this is going to have the same lore as the first game. It's going to have like the endless cycle, the same motif about human will and survival. Um, it's going to have like the dragon seeking out the Arisen and being a servant of the Seneschal, all that stuff. It's going to probably, like, be very consistent in that regard. It's going to feel the same as the first game, but it's going to be a completely different story with brand new factions, brand new characters. It's just going to be like an alt a parallel universe, but in the theme of Dragon's Dogma, it's just going to be focusing on a different cycle, a different endless ring. I am putting money on that. I think that's a very obvious take. Again, speculation. Remember to never take all the stuff officially. Do not mess up head cannon with cannon. That's all I'm saying. Yes, yeah, so we've got Blue Moon Tower over here. The geography seems similar, but there's a lot of key differences, like this whole new desert region to the east. Assuming Blue Moon Tower is still the north side of the map, then this is east. Maybe we'll get more insight into Blue Moon Tower, because Blue Moon Tower is an ancient structure that's been around in Grancis for a very long time. I think, like, the first Duke built it for whatever reason. Yeah, so I think this is just going to be, like, a Grand Sorin overhaul. This isn't like, oh, Grand Sorin set in the past, Grand Sorin developed into the future. I think this is just a fully realized Grand Sorin. This is like what the devs wanted Grand Sorin to be in the first game, but couldn't because of like resources and time management. That That's how I'm perceiving this, this whole game. That's how I'm perceiving it. It's just going to be like completely disconnected. Then we got ourselves the logo. Subtitles are useful because they tell you the names of the characters. So this is Ulrika, and she is her, and she seems to be some sort of strider. We're going to call her a strider for now. She talks about how what is seemingly the player character has forgotten about her, um, despite the fact that they protected her. So I'm, I'm smelling some sort of amnesia plot device going on here. I'm getting the vibe that she, uh, that your hometown was, like, ravaged by the dragon just, like, in the first game. And, uh, she's gonna be, like, what, the Kina of this game? Um, the childhood friend who was, like, saved by you from the dragon, but the plot twist is that you have amnesia. Continuing on, uh, let's just turn off subtitles. We have what appears to be guards and they seem to have a morian helm they've redesigned the guards and uh this right here i have i i should have all of this listed yeah so this is the trusty sword model right here and then this armor set and shield helmet is all completely new so they've completely redesigned the guards they've oversimplified the grand sorin logo not even dragon's dogma is safe from corporate logos oversimplification. Then he attacks something and it fades to black into Grigori fingering another person's heart. Probably yours. We can see a body down here. And then we continue onwards. Um, and we've got a pawn straight up. We know this is a pawn because she's got the scar. We then got other people here. 
they are probably all pawns as well. This is giving off major vibes to the encampment scene where the pawn legion like acknowledges you as Arisen and everything. Uh, she's wearing, I believe, the missionary's robes. There's there's primarily humans in this shot, but then there's just a beast man here, and we're gonna talk about the beast people later. Um, I'm gonna say this right now: beast men will be playable, and uh, I'll show you later why, in case you didn't notice, because I feel like a lot of people noticed that uh, didn't notice this because the compression on YouTube is so fucking dog shit. And then uh, we have ourselves uh, this guy who's probably a major character, like some sort of bodyguard, I'm assuming, like, or maybe a general. Um, his armor set is completely brand new, and then his, he's, uh, he's a warrior, and his longsword is saving grace. You can tell by the pommel and a bit of the hilt. Wait, no, what's that called? The handy holdy thing. <laughs> As for, like, the actual beast people, have you noticed that their ears are, like, on the side of their head? They didn't go for, like, putting ears on the top, even though, like, animals have their ears on the top. They went with, like, okay, so they have, like, beast features, but the ears are animalistic and they still go on the side of their head. Which, surprisingly, doesn't look too weird. It, it really blends, like, beast and man, so I think that's, like, a good design touch. And, um, it, it also just, like, makes more sense from a, like biological standpoint to have your ears on the side of the head for a humanoid. So I think this is a good opportunity to start talking about the beast races in more detail. So this is like a vocation and character concept sheet that was made and as you can see there's a beast man here and uh, the comment reads when I first joined the team they hadn't yet decided on things like vocations and races so I drew this group shot and the individual portraits below based on my general ideas about the fantasy genre Obviously, the beast folk representative just had to be a lion. It seems like beast races were a scrapped concept that were originally planned to be in the game. Same with elves. There's an elf here and here. And elves here, and you can even, like, have elf ears on your character in the game, which I think is a byproduct of the scrapped race. They, they were probably working on it and were like, fuck, we don't have time to properly implement this. So they just went, well, we already modeled the ears. We'll just let, we'll just leave that in the character creator. Um, they couldn't really do that with Beastmen though, but it looks like they're finally getting around to doing this concept that they've always wanted, and I'm very happy about that. That was one of the things I was hoping for. So this right here, the Pathfinder's talking, but we don't see her yet until later, so let's just take a look at this. Um, just a scenic shot of whoever this mysterious hooded person is. This is probably Pathfinder, I'm assuming? I'm assuming this is her. Or maybe this is Pathfinder. Wait, are they the same person? They may just be the same person. <laughs> oh, wait, fuck, I think they are because, like, okay, you look at this, right, hooded sort of thing, and then it cuts to this, and she's got, like, the same rocky mountain behind her as in the previous shot. So, yeah, I think that's just Pathfinder right there. And, um, I'm assuming she's gonna serve the same role as the Dragonforged. In the first game, her goal is she's like a past arisen, and her goal is to lead the current arisen or like guide the arisen on his path. She even says, You only need to believe in your own destiny. Her name is literally Pathfinder. Okay, she's just like, Oh, yeah, bro, I'll help you find your path. Um, she looks like far more spirity and ethereal than the Dragonforged did, even though the Dragonforged could only be seen by the arisen making him some sort of like ghost entity uh he didn't really look like it but it seems like perhaps they just want to enforce that more this is probably just a component of visual storytelling like, yeah she's a ghost only you can see her because only the arisen can see her moving on we're getting into combat and i am so excited to talk about this so this fighter seems to have the default savan preset from the first game so he appears to be wearing plated coat and the rest of his armor looks to be sectional iron plate. I think that's, um, Griffic Greaves. I could be wrong. I think I'm wrong. It might just be, like, standard iron boots. That shield is brand new, and then that sword is the default iron sword. Yeah, this is the iron sword from the first game. Now, we're gonna take a look at this. This skill is Burst Strike, a fighter skill. Well, no, a default, a, a core sword skill from the first game. And Basically, this is just like showing off, yeah, a lot of these skills are back. It looks better. This looks, it has more like build up. It's not quite so like, like his speed increase is gradual. If we play this at normal speed, 
You can see he like builds up speed first, while in the first game you kind of go at a fixed speed the entire time throughout that animation. So this just looks far more weightier. I made a community post about this, but let's just go over it like I'd never made that. So stop paying attention to the spider. I know he looks very handsome, but we're going to be paying attention to his pawn now. So he kicks off the strider, leaps into the air, and actually knocks an arrow and shoots it into that goblin. So it looks like we're getting some brand new aerial archery mechanics because this was not in the first game. You could like shoot in the air, but there were no mechanics behind it really aside from imminence, but that's not like, it wasn't really intended for that. There's no slow-mo, so it's quite difficult to aim and like your trajectory reticle will widen, making it harder to aim your shots. So there wasn't really any practical usage behind it, but it looks like, I think it's safe to assume that there's going to be like some aerial slow-mo, like there's probably going to be slow-mo applied, but because this is a pawn, pawns are just given god tier auto aim, like they don't need slow-mo, and it would like disrupt the player anyway. But I'm assuming when the player character uses this, you will enter a slow-mo state. And that's probably one of the reasons why this game is single player, because they want to implement slow-mo mechanics, which were like really prevalent in the first game, like Dragon's Moor had slow-mo, um, Masterful Kill had slow-mo, Clairvoyance, Snakebite. So this is one of the benefits to it being a single-player game. Don't have to worry about this sort of thing and how it, like, how compatible it is with co-op. And next up, we just have a warrior going absolutely nuts. We got weapon bloodying. This is the Warblade, by the way. That's the sword he's using. So he's using the Scale Coat, Scale Arm Guard. The boots are probably new, and his weapon is the Warblade, and he has no helmet equipped. Thankfully, he has no helmet equipped, because if we take a closer look, you can see that he's a beast man. So beast men are indeed playable. Some ragdoll going on here, that motherfucker just went flying. So in regards to playable beast races, this does make me wonder, will humans and beast races have different stats? Like, will beast races have more strength? Will they have special powers? Or are they just going to be, like, cosmetic? Or maybe beast races and humans will have like different stories. So like, you know how in Guild Wars 2, depending on the race you picked, it decides like your race quest and stuff. Maybe it'll be something a little bit similar to that, probably not to the same degree, but it may just have like story implications. And like, look at this goblin, this fucking head is retracted into its body. <laughs> Bro, there's a goofy as shit. I guess we can talk about the goblin models. So. Their designs look very, very, very similar to the first game, but their faces look more detailed and ugly. Their weapons are more or less the same. This mace here is what they used in the first game, those torches too. So yeah, we have a warrior beast man here, and we're going to talk about this attack he's doing. So whether or not this is a skill or a brand new basic attack combo, I'm not sure. I think it's a basic attack combo though. So it appears to be much faster than the basic attack combo in the first game. That is insanely fast for Warrior. So it looks like they're planning on speeding up Warrior to some degree. Um, as much as I love Warrior in the first game, I am excited to see like any potential improvements they shall make. Same with Fighter. Fighter is my favorite vocation in the entire game, one of my favorite classes in all of gaming. But I I'd still be very excited to see any potential like improvements they could make to the vocation. It looks like this has guard breaking pop uh, properties because I believe it like smashes through this guy's shield. I could be wrong though. I think I might. Okay, there's a shield here that he just like absolutely smacks through. So yes, there's still like guard breaking properties for Warrior. Um, then we've got this character, her name's Wilhelmina. She's gonna have a scream that sounds like this. Ah! Of course, that begs the question. If he's a mere mama, then where might our true original Empress name? So um, there seems to be some sort of plot regarding a fake Arisen, or maybe multiple. We'll probably talk more about that later. I don't think there's an awful lot to say in regards to that right now. So, if we continue on, we've got ourselves what looks to be another beast man, this time a ranger. This looks to be a ranger because this is a longbow, not a shortbow. Um, I think this is a good time to mention there are no daggers. This ranger is using no daggers, but this character here is this pawn is using daggers but has no bow so 
maybe you can only equip one at a time. I'm assuming, like, maybe Ranger can use just a long bow, but Strider can use either a short bow or daggers. Otherwise, they're separating them into two different classes. I'm not sure. This may be, like, an attempt to enforce team play with pawns. I think the fact that this game remains single player enforces that even further. They, they don't want you soloing this game. They want you working together with pawns. That is something that they very much so appear to be focusing on. This armor set that he's wearing looks to be completely new. This cape looks amazing, and so does all this, like, chainmail shit. Looks fucking awesome. Okay, in my notes, I've got written here, brand new armor. Can't identify the longbow. They all look the fucking same. And we've got ourselves fighting some goblins. We already talked about the goblins. And then we've got a golem over here. And this, the, the golem was quite grey in the original game, but here it's very orange and it matches the environment around it, the desert region. So we're probably going to have like a golem, like different looking golems, depending on where they're found. So in the desert region, they're going to be orange. And if we find them in the in central or western Grancis, they'll probably be grey. That's my guess. I am putting money on that. It's still got its laser beam attack and it probably still has amulets, though I can't see like, these little glowy spots here are probably the weak points. I feel like the ranger didn't do an amazing job aiming at it, though. It kind of just shot at fucking nothing. Still got its laser beam attack, but it's much faster this time. The laser beam attack in the original game is, like, long-lasting. But this one's just, like, a quick blast. So, uh, very interesting how they decided to change that. Maybe they just wanted something more impactful. And, um... I actually quite like the long shot though, so maybe it has both, we'll have to see. We only saw one attack after all. Anyway, we've got ourselves a fighter pawn over here, wearing um, iron sectional armor by the looks of it. And uh, prop yeah, that looks to be the plated coat, and that's the iron helmet. Uh, the iron sword and the same shield, the same brand new shield, which is probably- I'm putting money on this, it's going to be called iron shield. They're going to call it Iron Shield, and uh, he's using Iron Shield, the brand new one. The boots might just be like a new looking iron boots, honestly. They look somewhat similar to Malorian, or maybe Griffic. Yeah, this fight is kind of just vibing along, and then this, like, I'm assuming this is also a strider, despite using only daggers and no bow. Seems to have some sort of, like, white fluffy texture, ebon neck wrap, by the looks of it. I think the strider interrupted... The golem's blast because you can see it stagger at the end and then the fighter's just kind of doing his thing really showing off peak porn ai over here in the next shot i think this is mystic knight even though it's not using a shield i think they're giving mystic knight new weapons and we have not seen any like parrying at all in this trailer so maybe that's something they haven't finished yet maybe like mystic knight's still in development and they've only finished a couple things we didn't see any parrying with fighter either so um Mystic Knight's got some sort of blade staff looking thing. This is the Knight's Mantle with the Grand Surcoat. And then um, this is the Savan preset. And I think that's just the leather gloves. So we do have a lot of returning armor sets in this game, which has me very excited because like, if they introduce as many new armor sets as their returning armor sets from the first game, I will be insanely happy. That'll be awesome. So this is in the desert region as well. We've got cacti around the place. Uh, very we've got some like sort of drop here. Maybe this leads to a cave who knows and uh, He seems to be charging up some sort of spell in his hand. He's not even using his staff his like bladed Staff and it just like absolutely like wrecks these guys. They go absolutely ragdolling everywhere It's just crazy shit. You can see over here in the back. We've got ourselves a um, goblin chief This is a brand new look for the goblin chiefs while they do look bigger, which is like, they It actually may be a hobgoblin Maybe this is what a hobgoblin looks like. Um, like a hobgoblin chieftain, maybe. Because it's got, like, the sort of animal skull horned helmet. It's got a couple armor pieces. I think it's got, like, bandoliers around its waist. Maybe it's just a normal belt. Can't tell. Then, right here, we've got a magic archer. Brand new armor set as well. And the reticle is different. We're going to talk about the reticle more as casters, like, start appearing more in the trailer. And, um... This looks to be a minotaur. It's hard to tell from this angle, but I'm fairly certain this is a minotaur. And the magic archer seems to be charging up some sort of lightning rapid shot, like some 
not chain lightning, it's not quite ricochet hunter because it doesn't bounce off anything. This is like if ninefold bolt was lightning flavored. I'm fairly certain this is what it is. The minotaur leaps towards him. You can see it's a minotaur more so now. You can see the horns, you can see the kind of like- Oh my god, is that a hood? Is that a hood up? That's a hood up. Oh my god, I thought that was just hair. That's a hood up. We're getting hoods up, guys, as equipment. Not just like NPCs getting hoods up, we're getting hoods up. That isn't the salvation robe. You were allowed to pog. I give you permission to pog. Let's get back on track. So Minotaur gets um absolutely nailed. It's got some sort of like butcher axe. Maybe it'll be a bit like Oblivion how the Minotaurs can have axes and hammers. Maybe they'll just stick with axes, don't know. Anyway, we've got lots of some more furries. Um, she reminds me of like Queen Chimera. Is that her name? The one from Elder Scrolls Online. Whoever this Mela, Man Manella, whoever this M Manella is, um, she is telling us that Empress Nadinia, who is most likely her, her life is in our hands, so arisen. And um, she's probably like gonna be some sort of representative for the beast faction i'm assuming like like there's humans and beast men so like i'm assuming the arisen's destiny is to f like unite both of the races or something maybe there's some sort of like faction war going on who knows yeah this is giving me major vibes it's like oh yeah unite the two factions so there's probably gonna be like faction related quests or it'll probably just be condensed into like one main narrative rather than having it like as separate factions, though there may be like, maybe there'll be like a um, rapport system. Is that the right word to use? Some sort of like reputation system. I think there'll, there'll be something like that, potentially, who knows. There's probably like some sort of war going on here. Maybe the beast men have been like exiled to the desert region and they're like, hey, you want to go back home? And then these fuckers are like, yeah, Fuck you, you're a furry. I saw porn of you on Fur Affinity. I think she's gonna be basically the representative from like either a marketing or storytelling standpoint of the Beastmen faction. And it looks like Ulrika from the beginning is going to represent the human faction. She She's probably not gonna be the leader. I highly doubt she'll be the leader. But she'll probably be like the main character of the human faction, if that makes sense. It seems like protecting her from something is important to the main story. Maybe it's the human faction, maybe the humans are trying to take her life and weaken the beast folk. Um, that's the most obvious conclusion to draw, I feel like. We've got uh, this guy and his name is Brant. Brant? Probably Brant. His armor set is completely new and if we go back to um, Nadinia, her clothing is new as well. Not been in the game before. Same with her race. <laughs> anyway, uh, Brant. So he seems to be praising the Sovereign. We'll get a, like, a good idea of who that is later on. But um, he's probably like the underling of the antagonist. That's my guess. I don't know what his vocation is. Because he's just got like, like I was thinking, oh this looks like a dagger. This reminds me of Heaven's Key a bit. But he's only got one. So it makes me think that this is like just a weird looking sword. So it's, he's probably like a fighter of some kind. And, um, we're getting back into the gameplay stuff, thank god. I'd rather talk about that than the story, to be honest. Nights look so dark. They still look so dark. I'm so happy about that. One of my earliest, like, fondest memories of Dragon's Dogma was how dark the nights got and how I was actually, like, worried about not being able to make it back to the, like, to a rest spot before it got dark. And the, um... The enemies, their eyes still like reflect light, they still glow when exposed to light. As you can see, the fire is lighting up this goblin's eyes. Um, it's very intimidating seeing like a bunch of glowing wolf eyes in the night in the first game, so I'm glad that they're keeping this like immersion factor. Anyway, so this seems to be Magical Gleam from the first game, however it's cast by just what is likely a sorcerer. And um... Because originally only Magic Archer could like fire this at a spot and then it would explode into a beam of light. So um, this sorcerer lights up the sky. It intimidates... Oh, we'll talk about her later. This uh, intimidates a bunch of goblins, makes them go running. It staggers them. So rather than being just like light up the night and damage undead, it looks like they're trying to make this have a bit more of a practical usage. We're probably going to get more skill slots, to be completely honest. We're probably going to get way more. 
So it'll be like more practical to equip these sorts of utility spells rather than just being like, oh, but if I equip this utility spell, I'm not going to have room for my offensive skills and I can't kill things. Then there's like a warrior in the back. This looks like to be the Malorian Cyclops helm, if I remember correctly. Oh, <gasps> it's the Feral Cape! The Feral Cape is still in the game. That's the Feral Cape. I can't make out anything else. And there's like a fighter over there still wearing the iron sectional plate armor. Um, this is the default stuff. This is a weapon we've never seen before. Same with like that Mystic Knight footage from earlier. Well, I'm, pres I'm presuming that's Mystic Knight. They're wearing heavy armor. Anyway, uh, in regards to her, she seems to be um, using some sort of incense burner and creating some sort of mist bridge to close the gap between her and the Cyclops. This is probably... This, this does, uh, they're probably going to be trying to ex uh, expand on terrain spells because basically in the first game we had Frigor, which created a stepping stone and that was kind of it. So I think this is just going to be like, this, this vocation may be entirely focused to like these sorts of spells, not just terrain ones, but just utility ones in general. Maybe it's not a vocation. Maybe this is Sorcerer, but they like just a different weapon. It's like, oh, you can use a staff for offensive spells and a couple of utility ones, or you can swap to the incense burner for many utility spells. Because the casters really only had just, like, staffs. The hybrid vocations got some fancy weapons, but the actual casters, they had one weapon, and that was it. So I wouldn't be surprised if they decided that this is going to be the second weapon for caster. I don't want this game to just be, like, some Monster Hunter bullshit. Like, don't make it so that, oh, your class is decided by the weapon you pick. Like, no, fuck that. That is not Dragon's Dogma. That is Monster Hunter. Let Monster Hunter be Monster Hunter. Let Dragon's Dogma be Dragon's Dogma. I don't want them relying too heavily on the idea of, like, weapons completely decide your playstyle. I want it to be that, like, your vocation decides your playstyle, your weapon influences and changes it. Like, in the bounds of the vocation. Okay, next up, we just have a Sorcerer casting bolide and this weapon th these oh that's um fuck what's it called okay that's grievous horns that stuff is grievous horns what's that so i think this is the animistic robes but they've added like these little sleeve things to it anyway the sorcerer is casting bolide and we'll play it in real time and it looks like the cast speed is very very quick so after, like, boom, it's just like, as soon as it finishes casting, it goes straight in. While in the first game, there's a fair bit of delay. Like, you're left hovering there vulnerable for a while. But it looks like they're just trying to make Sorcerer kind of, like, quicker to play. I've never really had a problem with Sorcerer's slowness. I view that as just, like, that's just the vocation. It's slow and powerful, and that's what it's meant to feel like. But if they choose to speed it up, like, I don't think it'll... I don't think it'll, like, cause that many issues. I think it'll make more people happy. Like, I, I think I'll like it too. Like, this still feels powerful. Like, boom, and then meteor instantly, and that motherfucker just went flying. That's so good. Um, there's a couple pawns in the back there. I don't think there's much to say about them, though. There's a warrior doing stuff, but he's covered by meteor debris. And then there was just a, a, a fighter with the standard equipment we've seen so far. We've got Brandt praising the Sovereign of Vermont. I don't know what Vermont is, but there is a Sovereign of it. Maybe this is like another city, but I think we'll get more into that later. I, th I feel like we should talk about that more at the end. So there seems to be some sort of crowd. Okay, next up, this looks like Grand Siren to me, and we're gonna talk about this statue first off, because I feel like that's the main focus. Seeing as how this is a dragon, and a guy is standing on top of it with a crown, this is probably a, uh, a Risen, maybe the founder of Grand Siren. And um, you can see here, this is just a nice little detail, but there's a uh, water coming out of the dragon's neck, and it's decapitated heads on the ground, so it's like it's gushing blood. Very, um, very macabre. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's, uh, I don't know, that's so perfect. I love that. Grand Sorin looks immense. There's fucking so much shit. It's huge. The scale is insane. Like, the, uh, I don't know what to say, bro. Like, and there's like, look at all this shit. This could all be like different marketplaces here. I wonder how many of these buildings you can actually enter. <laughs> Then right here we've just got a tavern shop. We'll talk about the player character first. So they seem to be wearing the default ranger vocation outfit that you see in the vocation select screen in the first game. So that's like scholar's cape, blessed vest, the other stuff I don't remember. This short bow, no daggers again. So uh, this short bow looks to be the dire wolf short bow, 
but it's brown instead of white. And look at this, the quiver has matching fur. So I think, I'm fairly certain that quivers in this game, like I think bows will have matching quivers, which is like insane. I love that so much. Anyway, um, the lighting in this tavern looks great. There's many NPCs here. I'm assuming they're going for like a quantity of a quality approach with NPCs, which is sort of the new norm. And I honestly don't mind that because I feel like Elder Scrolls popularized having NPCs with all these advanced behaviors, but then as a result, towns just feel super deserted and underpopulated. I think having a bunch of like filler NPCs is a good thing for atmosphere. It's like, it can be immersion breaking when you're not able to talk to them, but I feel like it's more immersion breaking from a like, it's just constantly immersion breaking if a city's underpopulated has barely anyone in it. So I think this is a good choice. We see Brant over here. Brant, sorry. It, it, it's, a, it's really hard for me to say, like, air. That's just not... I, <laughs> I don't like that sound. It, it's not part of my accent most of the time. But um, we've just got him here, and this is probably, like, some sort of quest-related thing. So there's just, like, the Arisen walking through. That was a, that. Wow, they didn't want to show us that for very long. Uh, seems to be some guys playing, like, cards here. I wonder if they've got some sort of card minigame. I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, are they playing cards or are they just, like, chilling? They might just be chilling, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a card minigame. Anyway, Brant's here, probably for, like, some NPC, like, like some sort of quest. Probably this is, like, where a main quest takes place. And you're, like, following him or you have to meet him in the tavern. Some shit like that. Moving on, um, we have another shot of Grand Sorin. I can't really... What is this? There seems to be some sort of path that leads down here. This doesn't look like it's part of the city though. This looks like a massive gaping fuck off hole. So I wonder what that's going to be about. So after this panning shot, we go into Gregory. We're seeing Gregory for the first time, boys. So we only see him in this dark, ugly lighting. Okay, like it, it's good lighting, but it's, it's dark. And um, you can see his mouth flap on the side. Like you can see it like shaking stuff as he roars very nice attention to the detail he looks huge as always they're keeping the immense scale of the boy i don't know where this place is maybe this is like your hometown and it's been ransacked and butt fucked by gregory he's just come in and been like okay you're the protagonist of a jrpg now get fucked nerd and um then oh this is exciting this shit's exciting look at this fucking griffin the griffins still look amazing they put so much effort into the griffin models in the first game like even though it's simple they wanted it to stand up to scrutiny and be like an impressive creature because the griffin's meant to represent the face of dragon's dogma not just the dragon but like i know the dragon's meant to represent dragon's dogma but the griffin also represents dragon's dogma it's a very like regal impressive cool creature and it's like flies and you can climb it and burn its wings it's got like all the impressive monster mechanics behind it and it has like those lightning attacks and everything i'm getting off topic but as you can see here um, we have what appears to be a strider just going absolutely nuts on this griffin. We still have climbing attacks. Let's go. This just looks like the leather armor from the first game. Um, it's kind of hard to make out when he's moving around so much. And you can see that the griffins like got pained expressions now. So it looks like we're probably going to get more expressive monsters. Um, especially when they're taking damage. Because we did have that in the first game. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like they're just going to pull more effort into that. Because I don't really remember griffins being all that expressive look how high up this guy is in the first game if griffins flew to a certain altitude you would literally forcefully dismount it and probably would die from fall damage so it looks like they're not trying to limit the player as much anymore in terms of what vertical altitude they can achieve so i'm very excited about that and you can see the feathers flying everywhere as he damages the griffin so it looks like they're adding more details in regards to that and um, I don't think there's much to make out with this environment, but this looks like the desert region to me. This might be in between West and East Grand Sorin, or maybe like more so Central and East Grand Sorin, because there's like still a fair bit of um, greenery here. So this is probably like the transitioning era area into the desert region. That's my assumption. Oh, this is exciting too. This is so much, so much good shit here. And then this warrior looks to be wearing a um, redesign of the Immortals armor set. It's still got kind of like the flaps and the colors and all that. And the um, arms look the same, but it's got this kind of like metal butt flap. Oh, the belt's the same too. But it's got this metal butt flap that wasn't in the previous game. The helmet has the horns as well. That's so exciting. I'm so, oh, I love the Immortals armor set. And they've like, 
oh, I want to see that close up. I want to see what they've like, what else they've done with it. Um, but that's also really interesting because that's the only BBI equipment we've seen so far in the trailer. What's going on there? It like, are we going to see more BBI equipment even in the base game? Of Dragon's Dogma 2 because there's 100% going to be like a super difficult end game DLC like why wouldn't there be? Uh, okay there's so much in this fucking shot Jesus Christ. Got ourselves a fighter pawn with the Savan um, preset. This basically confirms that this is not a prequel about Savan because we've seen Savan as a player character and Savan as a pawn and he seems to be wearing the same armor. We've seen these uh, striders and fighters before so he seems to use some iteration of launch board Although the animation is different. The animation, he only uses one arm in this game, while in the second, it, in the first game, he used two arms to launch your pawn with your shield. So he throws the pawn on his shield, it latches on, it staggers the ogre. So it looks like they're trying to really, um, really make these utility skills more usable. Because I feel like, I feel like those skills were just too advanced for the technology of that time. It would take it would have taken so much effort and like time and resources that just weren't available during the development of the first game to make pawns utilize these skills to their full advantage. And as someone who like loves the pawn system as and has it tested it extensively, um, pawns just simply don't use this skill well. They do against certain enemies, like they use this a lot against Dark Bishop. They will throw you so much. And they use it against dragons all the time too, but they don't use it when dragons are flying. They use it when dragons are on the ground. And it's like, why are you doing that? Use it when the dragon's flying so I can hit it. It looks like they're putting a lot of emphasis in fixing these skills because I don't see why they'd include them so much in the trailer otherwise. And seeing as how it like automatically staggers, it looks like there's some sort of stagger property associated with launch board now. And uh, we're not, I'm not entirely sure if this is going to be like, maybe this stagger value will scale off your equipment. Or maybe it'll just be a fixed value. I hope it's not a fixed value. If it scales, that's better. That way it remains useful for the rest of the game. Because there's a few, fair few skills in Dragon's Dogma with fully knockdown properties, like Implicate, that scale off of your weapons. So um, if you have the strongest daggers in the game and you use Implicate, you're going to have a very high stagger value. So that really helps in making Implicate more useful. So I'm hoping that perhaps just make it scale off your shield or something. I know that doesn't make sense like from a literary, from a literal standpoint, but like who gives a fuck It's a video game and that would make it more fun. Let's talk about the ogre here. This ogre looks so awesome. Like look at all the fur details and like the transitions from fur to skin. Oh my god. I don't know how to describe it. He just looks so fucking good and like the wrinkles around his eyebrows. He just looks so more like... Just looks so much more detailed and aggressive. Um, he's kind of just standing there like an idiot. This warrior is using Warblade and, uh, as well. That seems to be a common weapon choice for this trailer. This attack that it does, I, I wonder if it's a heavy attack. Like, maybe they're properly implementing heavy and light attacks? Because weirdly enough, in Dragon's Dogma 1, heavy and light attacks basically do the same amount of damage. It's not like the swing speed's all that much faster either. This might be just like the basic heavy attack that he's done there. And then you can see the strider go straight in for climbing, but then it cuts to the next shot in which we have a mage with a stylized, updripped mahogany cape. I love the mahogany cape, so I'm glad to see it's back and looking better than ever. And I believe this is the animistic rope. Is, it, is that? Yeah, animistic rope with the extra flaps. Free this horn staff as well. And we've got ourselves an ox on a bridge, so it looks like ox quests are going to be like... There's going to be even more ox quests in this game, which is exciting for me, personally. No one else. Anyway, we've got ourselves another reticle. So the reticle here is a lot more minimalistic than it was in the first game. Because in the first game it was like a very harsh outline, but in here it's just the characters with some faded effect um, on the outer ring. And if we go back to Magic Archer, we can compare the reticle there... And it looks, it looks different because this one's like just a glowing ring with the characters on the inside. So I wonder, maybe each spell will have a different reticle. Not just a color change, but I mean an actual full-on visual, like a different visual. Maybe magic archers and sorcerers just have different um, spell reticles. So, don't know. Anyway, this cyclops stomps the bridge and it causes the bridge to collapse. So we got some destructible environments. 
The falling animations from, like, the player character and the ox are very underwhelming. This might just be, like, an underdeveloped feature. They may choose to, like, add more animations. Maybe this is just what it's going to look like. Oh, we can't talk about that yet. We can't talk about that. We're going to lose that later. But we're, we're just going to have to see. And then next up, we've got these... Either the player character and the pawn interacting, or two pawns interacting with each other. So, we're going to have some emoting, guys. Very excited about that. I've always wanted that. I think that would help uh, improve the bond between pawns. By the way, this guy has um, the trooper's outfit equipped underneath. So this furry thing is 100% in outer armor, and trooper's outfit is under clothing. I can't identify those boots. I think they're brand new. I'm not sure. And it looks like they killed um, a cyclops. And then we've got ourselves the play character interacting with a rift stone. I think that's the iron headgear with the ebon neck wrap. Weak guard. That looks like the weak guard, based off the skirt. I can't see the chest piece though, but it might just be blurred here. And um, the assembled vest, I'm guessing? I'm guessing that's assembled, uh, assembled vest. I can't make out the boots because they're covered in rift cloud fart fog. So, got ourselves a fancy rift stone animation. And it seems to be like, this seems to be set in some sort of encampment because there's a tent here. So maybe it's a rest spot. Or this is like just another encampment. Then we got ourselves Medusa, a brand new enemy probably gonna be like okay don't even have to say probably she's gonna have like very heavy petrification mechanics like the cockatrice from the first game but on steroids i'm guessing we're gonna have to dismember the snakes individually I'm, I'm guessing like the hydra heads but imagine hydra but on a smaller scale then after medusa we've got uh, a sphinx i think a sphinx was in dragon's dogma online this staff is brand new but this is still the animistic robes, and I have no idea what that cape is. I think that's a new two. So, um, not sure what her mechanics are going to be. Maybe she'll be, like, some sort of caster-heavy boss. She has a key around her neck, so I'm assuming she's going to be, like, maybe you have to kill her to steal the key and go into a thing. Is that a key? Do you guys think that's a key? That looks like a key to me. But there's, like, this thing. I think that's a key. I'm fairly certain that's a key. Anyway, um, she's got a very charming smile. British dental healthcare though. Now we've got this absolutely spectacular cinematic griffin shot. I have no idea, like, okay, so you can see arrows flying at this griffin and they seem to bounce off it and fall down, but it also kind of looks like the wing flaps repel the arrows. I don't think they're gonna do that though, but holy shit, if griffin if, if griffin wing flaps can repel arrows while it's flying, that's gonna, like, nerf ranged vocation so heavily, and I'm all for that. Like, you're gonna have to use a super strong shot. Like, you're gonna have to charge up a shot to go through, like, to, to break through the wind resistance of the uh, griffin wing flaps to damage it, and maybe, like, because of the wind resistance, it'll do less damage. Oh, I'm sorry. My ranged vocations lander it, it does not know when to rest. Very nice cinematic shot. Very beautiful lighting. Then we've got Grigori. And uh, let's just, like, let's just listen to him. So Grigori is, fa is voiced by David Lodge. I know he said it doesn't sound like him, but it is. Um, I was just wrong. That is most unfortunate. But it doth not release thee from thy yeah, I, I can definitely hear David Lodge now. I couldn't the first time I watched the trailer because I was too busy losing my shit. <laughs> so, um, let's go back. Grigori's eating the heart. I'm assuming this is, like, part of the intro cutscene uh, where he kills you. How does he, like, why does it just, like, go off his finger? I guess he's, like, throwing it in. He's moving his finger a little bit, but it, it looks kind of weird. Nom nom nom. Yummy yummy. We're gonna talk about... Oh, his name is just Dragon. Yeah, this isn't confirmed to be Grigori. That makes sense. Because Grigori was just, like, the name. So, I'm gonna call him Grigori for convenience sake, but don't take that literally. Um, this is gonna be a completely different dragon. He's gonna have a different name. It's just the same appearance because the Seneschal's not very creative when he makes his, like, servants, I guess. So he's saying that is most unfortunate. And then he speaks a bunch of fucking dumbass old English yada yada. Doth not release thee from thy fate. Like, shut the fuck up. That's like, that's how he spoke in the anime. And it was like, so cringe. I, like, I don't like that. I really don't like that. That is the thing from this trailer that I hate the most. The thing I hate the second most are the oversimplified Grand Soren shield logos. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, so 
this fucking dialogue is dog shit. Uh, they're gonna make him talk like that for the rest of the game. I think this game's gonna have a dog shit story based just off that dialogue. Like, oh my god. I'm not gonna be able to enjoy David Lodge's dragon monologues if he's fucking talking like that. I hope you guys like it at least. Anyway, we got a shot here. Uh, it kind of gives off the impression that he's like some sort of king. Maybe the king of Grand Sorin or some sort of duke, perhaps. But then... Brant was Brant 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 um from earlier was talking about long live the sovereign of Vermond. So what is Vermond? Maybe this is like an enemy faction. So maybe Vermond is is another city or it's an enemy faction. I don't know. Whoever he is, he is most likely the sovereign of Vermond. So we got so he seems to have his own army and everything. And then these I'm guessing these are his pawns and. We're going to talk about um, the thing in his chest later when we get a closer shot, but let's talk about these characters first. And um, this is the Barbarian Chief's Helm. This is Steel Urchin. She looks to be wearing the frame plate armor. I don't know the leg piece. I do not remember. And I think that's Battle Greaves, though I could be wrong. I think it's a different looking Battle Greaves, at least. Over here, she's got Magician Surcoat. I cannot identify that staff, it's too far away, and it looks like just leather gauntlets, and that appears to be the circlet. And then this is some sort of strider or ranger. I think she's wearing completely new armor, though I could be wrong. I think that's, I think that's, um, oh, I think that's the archer kulots. I think that's how you pronounce it, but like, it looks a little bit different. It might be a stylized version of it. I believe these arm pieces are new. I could be wrong as well. This is a very zoomed out shot, so it's hard to tell. Especially in this lighting. Like, this lighting's so fucking dark. I can't make out any details. And, um, these boots look very familiar. They look like something Madeline would sell in her shop. Anyway, moving on from, um, what are probably this guy's pawns. Because I reckon this is an Arisen. And, um, you know, considering that he has a thing stuck in his chest... And hearts are like a massive visual motif in this game. Yeah, he's probably an Arisen. I'm guessing this is a Wake Stone. It's the same fucking colour. He's put a Wake Stone in his chest to achieve immortality, I'm presuming. So, a one major component of the storytelling in Dragon's Dogma is how um, you become Arisen and you gain immortality. But if you want to protect the world from the dragon... You have to go out of your way and risk your life to kill it because you just, you can still die from like fatal injuries. You just can't die from old age. You have to go out of your way to risk your life to kill the dragon and then you lose your immortality doing so. So that's like, that's meant to speak to like the strength of your character, whether or not you're willing to give up your life and immortality to like save the people. That being said, what if you just were like, oh, I want to kill the dragon. Because if I kill the dragon, I ascend the throne. However, I do like this immortality I have. What if I kill the dragon, and then once I get my heart back, I replace it with a wake stone? Or what if I just do that before I even get my heart back? Why don't I just, like, shove a wake stone in my heart, in, in my chest, and then I gain immortality? That's my theory. That's, like, that's my speculation on what this guy is doing. He just wants, he wants the glory of killing the dragon so he can ascend the throne while keeping his immortality. So he puts a wake stone in his chest. That way, getting his heart back doesn't restore his mortality. That's, that's my guess. And he's going to be some sort of, like, tyrannical, power-hungry, evil guy. You can tell because his beard is evil and his smile is evil as well. And his outfit's red and black, and that's evil. And then there's this, like, twink here. This twink is definitely his son, 100%. And he's like, oh, my, my father be the stinkiest duke known to Grancis. Or something like that. He's probably going to sound like that. And you're probably going to join sides, uh, sides with him. So you can uh, kill this guy. Because he's bad. And then uh, next up, we just have, like, Grigori, like, being spicy. Like, breathing fire transition into Logo. That's um that's the trailer analysis. That that took how long have I re I've been recording? I've been recording for nearly ninety minutes. Holy fuck! It took me ninety minutes to talk about a trailer that's not even two minutes long. <laughs> Let's wrap this up because my throat's sore. I am very happy with what I'm seeing so far. I I just want like I just want more Dragon's Dogma. I just want Dragon's Dogma with the new content, improved systems, improved mechanics, improved visuals, improved. Story is optional, I don't really care about story too much, though like I am aware and 
appreciate the lore of the game and, and the writing and everything. I, I do think the game has a good story. If this game has a bad story, I, I won't care. It won't really affect my enjoyment of the game too much. That, that's that, that's my personal opinion. Uh, 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 okay. So this just looks like Dragon's Dogma remastered. But that's like the highest praise I can possibly give it. Because this just like... Like Dragon's Dogma is has a peak foundation. It is a peerless foundation. You just need to refine its mechanics. Just refine it, improve it. Like, oh my god, this shit is so good. It's so fucking good. I'm so like, I, I just want to play this game so bad. Capcom, please. I am my one of my biggest fears when Dragon's Dogma 2 was announced was that the game was just gonna be like like Capcom was just gonna be like, oh, we're very successful with like Monster Hunter. And Dark Souls is super popular, so we're just gonna make Dragon's Dogma basically Monster Hunter and Dark Souls. Like, we're just gonna make this a Monster Hunter clone. We're just gonna make this a Devil May Cry clone. We're gonna completely ruin the identity of Dragon's Dogma because we feel like copying what's already successful would appeal to more people. I am so glad. This basically proves that they're just trying to keep their identity, refine it, like, everything I, uh, th th this this has like relieved me so much like I, I just feel so much better about this game already from this info it's like i shouldn't have expected anything less considering the same director is working on it and he's very passionate about his project so yeah i'm very excited and um i think that's it i'm sorry for keeping you guys for so long um thank you if you got to the end i'll try to make like actual videos and not shitty analysis garbage um, at some point. I, I kind of want to, like, I'm kind of motivated. I'm a little bit motivated. So, um, I'll see you guys next time.